joined, um, giving your time today. Um, that's great. This is the basis of what we're about at the FEMC. Um, and so I'll be talking about the FEMC, um, ways you could use the things we've produced in the network that we've created um, in various different ways. Should we uh, hmm. take a quick look at the poll results um, before? Sure. Okay, yeah. let's see. Well, I'll, I'll leave the poll open, but can you see the results so far? No one from Vermont. They probably know about us, so. <laughs> Great, this Shocking. is a good, good range of folks. Yeah, so we have a good variety from Maine, New Hampshire, uh, wow. New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, other. Um, let's see. So there's a question, do you collect data? Um, 77% of folks that responded to the poll collect some kind of data. Um, everybody mm -hmm. uses data that other people have collected. Yeah. That's really good to know. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a question about question four. If the data that I use um, can be entered freely or needs to have regenerated or predetermined options. Um, Ali, do you want to just answer that question of, of what that question means really quickly? Um, yeah, you created that question. I don't know that well, I add that, added that. Oh, you did. Yeah, I, I did see the question. Um, so, so the, uh, does the does the data that people use can it be entered freely, or does it need to have uh, regenerated options? So maybe that will come up during the presentation. Um, I don't know if it's like multiple choice versus other. Oh, um, yeah. I don't think that should have been a question. That was a. Anyways, we'll we'll move on. But thank you. But yes, it's great to see that some people have. Um, attended an FEMC event before. Um, uh, many people haven't, so that's perfect. Great. This is kind of an overview of, of who we are and, and what we do. So um, it's great to see that. I kind of wanted to get with this is like how we organize and manage data. Um, so I will talk about that. Let me All right. get rid I'm of going the to, poll here. I'm, and I'll end the poll at this point. Um, great. So thanks, people, for participating. Um, and with that, um, again, if you have questions, please type them into the chat box, and Ali will address them at the at the end of the presentation. Um, if we have time after that, um, then we might open up the uh, the voice lines. But for now, um, we'll stick with uh, with the presentation. So, Ali, take it away. Great. Okay. So, just a little bit about me. Um, for I, I saw the list of registrants, and um, some names I recognize, but many I don't. So. Um, I'm uh, Ali Kasiba. I'm a forest ecologist and tree physiologist here at the University of Vermont. Um, and also I work for the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. So I'm really interested in how trees and forests um, in our region are responding to environmental stress. And um, you know, more and more of that is climate change, but it includes pests and pathogens, disturbances, human uh, forestry and management, um, and the whole gamut of what a tree and a forest uh, lives with and responds to on the day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis. And more and more I'm interested in how we convey information, how we share uh, data and information um, to make really informed decisions on the best science that we have available. And this really gets into um, the FEMC because we think about we have so much information now. We live in a time, I'm sure we all recognize this, of information overload, right? We have we have, you know, minute by minute data that we can collect on on air temperature and water and and data from all sorts of different independent studies. And frankly, it can be hard to really know how to connect those data. What are the integral messages that those data are conveying? Um, and we are actually at risk of losing information because it's not stored properly. It might be on someone's computer that could get flooded, or um, it might be on paper copies. So we're really at this this kind of point um, in data of thinking about how do we manage data and how do we make sure that we don't lose data um, that could be really important because we need long-term records. We often um, think of studies that happen, they might have had one purpose, but they can be used for a number of different purposes, answer a lot of different questions as they arise. So this is where the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative steps in. It actually began um, in the early 90s as the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative for this exact reason, um, to collect, to get information from the University of Vermont, the Green Mountain National Forest, and the forest, uh, the Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation State Agency. So lots of different folks were working on the same issues then. It was really acid rain 
deposition on forests was a really, really big um, environmental issue. Um, and they found that different people or different stakeholders in the state were often not knowing what other people are doing. So they started with an actual physical card catalog of different research and data that people had collected or were working on. But we realized a couple years ago that a lot of these issues that happen in Vermont in terms of our forests are really represented, representative of the broader region, right? Those borders that we have are not that important as far as pests transfer as far as species, climate surely affects the entire region. And so we expanded to this New England, um, New York region where we all have their similar, although different things going on, but we can share information across these states um, and have this broader collaborative. So how we actually operate is very unique um, and it allows us as the FEMC to be in this really um, perfect role in between agencies, um, federal government, and also independent foresters, private landowners, um, all sorts of different people, the general public, students. So how we operate is that we, it's a lot like a, a nonprofit in that we have a committees that help govern our decision making. So we have a steering committee that is made up of representatives from the region, and they help oversee what we should be working on, how our budget operates, all those kind of things. But we also, have state partnership committees. So from each of those states, states can um, find folks that they want on this committee. And those committees help then guide what we're working on. Um, so we get input from the states. And we also, as I'll touch on at the end, we also, um, to help uh, incentivize states from really working with this, is we do uh, work for them. So we actually will do state-specific projects. And I'll touch on a couple of those. It's really been a great um, relationship with state agencies to address a specific question that they have and they may not have resources to do it. So as you can see, we're a pretty small group. Um, there's only four of us um, full-time uh, staff, but we have a lot of students and technicians and interns that we really rely on uh, to, do, to do a lot of this work. So the work that the FEMC does can be broken up in kind of these, these four silos, and I'll talk about them individually. The first I'll talk about is the um, data archive and access and integration, because this is really the kind of core part of the FEMC. And this really hinges on this great, um, very easy to use data archive, and I really encourage everyone to go check it out. Um, you can see the URL at the top of the screen. Um, and it's a data archive for any forest ecology data, um, and it doesn't have to be specific to the region the FEMC is involved in. We're interested in, in really anything. We're interested in preserving data and having data be well attributed. So there's a lot of good components of this that have been well thought out, and um, it's storage and perpetuity. We have machine-readable metadata. So all of these, th these things allow um, for technological changes to not lose data. We see this all the time. People have, oh, data stored on an old floppy disk or something, and that's really hard to extract um, and read and transform into something that um, won't, will be able to be read in 20 years and 50 years. And this is free. It's free to archive. It's free to access data. Um, and so I encourage you to look at it. There's different search options um, for how to filter for um, studies. There's monitoring. There's uh, all sorts of different types of information uh, collated on here. And what, if you go into one project on the archive, you can see that there, there's a lot of information that's conveyed. So this is an example of one. This is a project that Jim Duncan and I did um, for the state of New York, but it just gives an example of what kind of things you can store on the archive. So it includes things like normal, like, you know, CSV tables, right? We think about data, but it can also have images documents. You could have links to websites or web maps like this, this one does. It has a link to a web map. Um, you can have ArcGIS shapefiles. You can have Python scripts. So it really accommodates a wide range of, of information and data. And you can see everything is really well attributed. There's a citation. We have metadata. For each of the um, files you upload, you actually uh, indicate what the units are on each column. And so it's really um, transparent and easy for someone to understand how to use and interpret the data. And it also allows the person who collected the data or did the analysis to, to have a great way to store the information um, in a very organized and usable fashion. 
And one subset of this I wanted to touch on in case folks have any data that would be um, really useful is we are really pushing um, to rescue data. And this really, I mean, is a really big tenet of what the FEMC does, but we're really concerned as people are retiring, as technology is changing, that we're going to be at risk. And we probably already have lost data and information. So we are offering free um, uh, a rescue of archiving for certain data sets that seem like they would be have a high potential impact. And so those are ones that, especially a long-term record um, that are monitoring or inventory data um, or something that a, a, you know, a big audience would really um, find useful. So that could really vary. Um, we've been doing some of this for the past year, scanning historical reports, doing all sorts of um, archiving of different data sets. And it's, we're finding that it's a really uh, it's a big need in the region and there is a lot of data that could be um, lost. So if you have anything, please get in touch with the FEMC with me um, or anybody else at the FEMC um, and we consider, consider if that data set would be good for um, this data rescue project. If it's not, it, you can still archive on our um, FEMC archive and that's a free service. You can, we have a user interface that makes it fairly easy for anybody to do that. So uh, next part we do, and I'll kind of only touch on this a little bit, is our ecosystem monitoring. So we help support a number of other ecosystem monitoring ventures that I didn't mention here, um, but we help uh, support, for example, um, Vermont Center for Eco Studies on a mountain bird watch. But the two uh, monitoring programs that we oversee is forest health monitoring and air quality monitoring. And the forest health monitoring program uh, we currently have been doing in Vermont for five years and in Massachusetts for one year. Um, we're also expanding it regionally. So the idea is that um, compared to forest inventory and analysis, plot measurements that the Forest Service does, these are annual measurements of the same plots. So it gives us a really uh, early detection signal for any declines in forest, forest health or some uh, uh, new novel stresses that forests could um, face. And again, we make all this data and information widely available on our archive um, that you can go peruse and look at it. So what I'll talk about mostly is our tools and projects and collections, and I'll talk about the collaborative network at the end, uh, as well as plug our upcoming conference. But our tools and projects and collections is really where we've put a lot of effort in the last um, two years in doing novel analyses and uh, aggregation of information. So we've broken these up into kind of tools and collections. The division isn't, you know, very hard and fast. This gives you a sense of uh, a couple of the uh, collections we've done. So they really aim to organize data that's similar or has some sort of unifying theme and increase ease of access. So a lot of time when you're looking for data, you have to look at a lot of different places. You have to contact people. You may not even know that data exists. Um, and this is true for a lot of these uh, collections. And um, some of these have been specific requests from our state uh, partnership committees, like the Catskills Science Collaborative Data Catalog, which is really uh, for folks that work in the Catskills Mountain of New York to have a centralized repository. And then some of these other ones are much broader spanning, like our Dendro Ecological Network, which I will touch on. And again, you can see at the top um, URL, for finding those if you're curious. So one of these that we made last year is really um, geared towards a pretty uh, entry level user, um, uh, students, folks that are interested in, in climate change, of visualizing climate change. And this really came out of the fact that we, um, our committees identified that it's really hard to know where to look for climate change data um, and information. It can be overwhelming. There's a lot of clearing houses that just have a lot of information. Um, so we made this very user-friendly, uh, visually nice uh, tool called the Climate Connection. And so it has links to um, interactive uh, tools online where you can explore climate change as well as the impacts of climate change. So you see here we made it, we picked some of, uh, it's very curated, the best that we could find of different ways to visualize um, how our climate will change or maybe interpret how our climate are will change. Some of these are maps, some are more story maps that walk you through um, the potential changes we'll see. 
And then we also curated a list of really nice and interactive tools we found where you could look at the impacts of climate change on forests. So things like change in first leaf date in the spring um, or maps that show the risk of erosion. So all of these are uh, very uh, easy to use, visualize um, tools, great for folks that just want to explore um, different impacts that, that we may see in the future. A little bit more specialized tool or collection that we built, so this is really a little bit more geared towards researchers and scientists because um, it includes um, dendrochronological uh, data, so that's tree ring data. And one of the big things that um, came to light is that uh, traditionally uh, dendrochronology has not really uh, incorporated ecological factors. So things even like tree size or soil or uh, density, you know, basal area density of the stand. And that was a little bit separate from the traditional field of tree ring research. So we created the Dendro Ecological Database in collaboration with partners at the U.S. Forest Service and U UVM. And this is a really easy, nice way to, uh, for folks to archive their data. I, I have uh, tree ring data um, and I've archived my data on here. It's it's a really great way to do that, and it also makes it very easy for other people to explore um, and use and download data. So we're um, working on expanding this, and it's a, a, a great way to filter for looking at different species, looking at geographic locations or different um, variables that someone collected. So if you're really interested in having, looking at tree, tree growth um, with basal area density metrics, there'd be a way to filter through that with the advanced search option. So tools, we've also built, they're kind of like collections, but they, we try to provide a novel way to, to view and interpret the data so they have a little bit higher level of maybe analysis um, and, uh, component to them. Again, URL, top, very searchable within our, uh, uh, our, our website. And you can see this, there's a variety of different um, tools that we've built, and we're constantly building these uh, over time. And one I thought that uh, Forest Guild members might be interested in um, is our Northeastern Forest Health Atlas. Um, so this grew from the idea that uh, there's over a, a lot of states in the region, every state in the region actually, has aerial detection surveys of tree damage that are flown by fixed-wing aircraft at least once a year. Um, but they weren't really easy to um, compare across states and also there were uh, many years of data that were still on paper copies. So we did two things in that we merged uh, the states and the region together and made the, um, the detection surveys uh, similar across those so they have the same attributes. But we also digitized historical records. Um, and in places like Maine, those records go back to 1918, which is pretty incredible. So um, this allows over 100 years of data, um, specifically in Maine, but in many other states, many decades. Um, and you can filter in really interesting ways um, by the specific type of damage or perhaps you're interested in an insect or pest or abiotic damage like wind. How often does that happen? How, much, how often does flooding have, get mapped um, in aerial detection surveys? And we've also allowed ways to not only download the data and access it, which is, again, a tenant of the FEMC, but produce some really, uh, some pre-made maps, some um, shape files if, you're, if you go that direction and you use something like ArcGIS. So you can do all sorts of different manipulations in there. And you can see you can filter um, by the agent, which is actually when they fly over these areas, they'll attribute each damage to a pest like forest tent, caterpillar, um, et cetera. The type, so you might be interested only in mortality. The years you can filter, where it happened. And we also have linked um, some research that's relevant to those specific damage agents if you want to explore that. So what this kind of looks like when you do it, so at this top I've uh, filtered just by gypsy moth, which is um, a really uh, big issue in, especially in the southern part of New England and Massachusetts and Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, but you can see it's expanding in, into other places um, in the last couple of years. And what you can do 
is if when you filter just by the last four years, and you can color code it based on the year that that was mapped. And you can you could actually zoom in to specific locations and see how many times a, a forest patch has been damaged by gypsy moth, because that's going to more likely lead to mortality and, and severe decline. And see those patterns about um, where it's happening relative um, to forest patches. And you can do all sorts of stuff like produce tables and, and maps by the acres damaged. This is by the type. So if you're maybe interested just in where has there been mortality from gypsy moth, you could, you could look at that. And like I said, you can then download this into various options that are free, available to anyone, and you can download um, all sorts of pre-made. We focus on kind of the big, the big insect pests here, but you know, if there's something that you'd like to see, we can easily create it. Um, it's, it's not, a, if you were, wanted a pre-made map, you can definitely contact us about that. So that's the Forest Health Atlas. Another different type of tool we built is a little bit, uh, a little bit different, and this um, we call the Forest Indicators Dashboard. And here um, is the example for Vermont. Um, we piloted it first in Vermont, and we are expanding it. We will be doing an Indicators Dashboard in New York and New Hampshire. Um, so they were uh, the state partnership committee me committees were excited about this pilot for Vermont and um, wanted it to be tailored to New Hampshire and New York. And so how it works is that we take a, a number of data sets that are related to the environment and, and forest ecosystems, and we compute uh, basically a, a, a level, an annual score, so for each year and a long-term trend, and the annual score is related to what we set the target for. So for example, things like acid deposition, we know that the, you know, the pH of unaffected rain should be about 5.6. So that's our target. As we approach that level of 5.6, which we're below, um, the score gets better. And as we get away from that target, the score gets worse. For other things like climate, for annual temperature, we want the target to be right around the average, right? That's what trees and forests are adapted to and things that live in the forest. And as we deviate away from that, the score will become worse. So it really depends on, we tailored it specific to each data set. And then the long-term trend is, is there a trend in the um, long-term data that is significantly increasing or decreasing? And we've divided them into these four main indicator categories. So it's forest structure, how are the trees laid out, what is the um, age diversity, size diversity, um, what is the condition of the forest, so things like the um, lushness of the canopy, um, how has that changed from year to year? What are the stressors that have affected forests, so acid deposition, ozone, invasive pests and pathogens? And what are the services that forests provide, so things like hunting, recreation, maple syrup, um, again, this was tailored to, to Vermont, so all those things are very important here, and how have those um, metrics changed over time? And an example of one, this is just an example for tree growth, um, and so you can see on the left, this is in the condition uh, category that I just showed, and so these are the, the data sets that make up condition. Um, we used uh, experts from Vermont to figure out how do we want to weight these um, to give an overall condition score. So that's what these um, uh, numbers are, are here. So 15%, 15%. Um, so if you look at tree growth, the score for 2017, we're updating for 2018 right now. Unfortunately, we are a year different because of when data sets are available. So we're doing the 2018 update currently. Um, so the score for 2017 was pretty good, 4.5 out of 5. Um, and that means that it hasn't deviated too far from that, that target, which for tree growth is we want it to be about the same every year, right? We'll, we'll allow for some variation, but we don't want it to wildly uh, increase. That could mean uh, something is going on that, that could crash in a few years, and we also don't want tree growth to really plummet. That would also be very problematic. And the long-term trend uh, that is not changing over time, you can see this looks a little decreasing, but it's not significant. And a lot of this is this past year, 2017, tree growth 
rebounded a little bit. So we're overall, tree growth is very stable, and that's a great thing. And so for each one of those uh, 30 so data sets for indicators, we give a score for the year and a long-term trend, and then aggregate those together. And really, this tool is geared for people that are uh, students, educators, ways to convey different um, um, uh, parts of the forest, but really for decision makers, policy makers to look and say, okay, look, we're really seeing that there's an issue in um, precipitation of rainfall. Maybe we should think about um, ways that we can uh, legislate to change that. And um, one, I mentioned at the beginning that we also really take, um, take input from our state partnership committees. Um, so we uh, do at least one project and often a few projects for each state that is uh, involved with FENC. And so we really value these um, relationships. And this is a great opportunity for states because um, we can provide a really quick turnaround analysis or product um, that meets a specific need that they have asked for. So a couple of these that we've been working on recently. Um, this is one that uh, has been um, really interesting to work on, and this is a, an inventory of intensive clearing, forest clearings for New Hampshire. So it's a spatial analysis looking at where do we see uh, uh, intensive or moderately intensive uh, forest management uh, in New Hampshire. And so we map those. And what this also allows us to do is look at what percentage of those clearings are for silviculture and those forests would be allowed to regrow and, and maybe cut on a cycle. What and what percentage are for land use change, right? As our forests are converted into non-forest uses, we're likely not going to get those forests back. Um, and so understanding that those dynamics are really important. And so this shows here, these blue um, dots are all the mapped forest clearings um, between 2000 and 2018. Um, and examples uh, of different types of clearings that we can see. So in Coas, which is really has a, a lot of um, traditional silviculture, um, you can see pretty large uh, uh, management area, and these different colors indicate different years of cuts. So this is kind of a traditional way that one area would be cut, and then the next year some, some other adjacent area, et cetera. And in other places, we see large, uh, larger clearings um, that are for silviculture, but then we also see clearings for plan development. Um, and there are very interesting patterns about where this was happening and the rate at which it was ha it's happening through the state. And what some of these results are, are quite interesting. So we actually looked at the post-harvest outcome for 10% of these cuts. So the whole suite of cuts you saw in the last um, image, we uh, visually uh, rated each 10% of those um, for the post-harvest outcome. So this is based on aerial imagery. Do you see evidence of, of uh, roads being built, infrastructure coming in, and in subsequent imagery, can we actually see that there was maybe a cul-de-sac or a house built? And that would really, um, that obviously is, that means that that land was cleared. Trees might have been removed for civil cultural purposes, but that the post-harvest outcome was development. And what we actually saw, we were really expecting that the rate of development, uh, clearance for development had increased, but you'll see on this uh, gray line at the bottom, we actually did not see that. Um, and so that was actually really positive when we're seeing an increase uh, in the, num the amount of clearing for forestry. But those forests are working forests. They provide great um, economic value for the state of uh, New Hampshire. And uh, they're, if they're managed in a, a really responsible way, that's a, a great finding that we're having more forest land for forest management. And this actually allows us to figure out what amount that we have for early successional forests. And this is a thing that a lot of states are, are uh, trying to figure out is how much early successional forest should we have in our state? What would have been um, historically and how much do we have now? And it's really hard to know that when a lot of uh, forestry happens on private land. So from this work, we can estimate, uh, we estimated about 6,000 acres were cut in New Hampshire per year as just intensive cuts. So those are what we would call clear cuts. Um, and 
of all the cuts we had, about 80% were for silviculture, so that would mean 20% were for development or agriculture land use change. And so you can convert this into how many acres would we estimate is for early successional forests, about 5,000, which is less than 0.1% of New Hampshire's forest land per year. So it's a very, it's not a large amount. Um, and uh, we could easily, I don't think we're, New Hampshire's at any risk of having too much early successional forest. So thinking about where we have early successional forests, um, is that, are those places in uh, good locations for bird migration, animal migration is a, a next step that could be done with these kind of maps to map out um, where we're seeing those early successional locations that could be created. Another state project, which we'll see what we're doing on time, oh good, um, is we did for New York. Um, they were really interested in, in stream corridors and losses of hemlock from hemlock woolly adelgid. So this really comes down to a water quality issue because a lot of the uh, upstate forests are really um, important for water, especially, especially in New York City. And so they asked us to do a spatial analysis to look at uh, stream corridors and where hemlock might be at most at the highest risk of, of mortality. So we created this um, really use, easy to use um, online map that you can go check out from the link down here. And what it allows you to do is kind of start at the watershed level um, and, and, and these darker colors over here indicate higher potential losses of hemlock basal area. And you can kind of zoom in, zoom in, you're interested in this watershed. As you zoom closer, the actual streams um, show up. They, they can't show up at a higher uh, level because they're just, it's a very dense uh, network. So you can zoom in, zoom in, and as you get these different colors, again, these show um, different levels of projected losses of hemlock, and perhaps even zooming in all the way to the stream segment. And this is really geared, this tool is geared for um, prioritizing research management, um, understanding where there may be the most risk of hemlock losses that could affect water quality, water quantity. And it also allowed us to quantify how much of this riparian buffer is at risk. And we found that almost half is um, at risk of some losses. Um, and as we lose hemlock from those riparian areas, we could have erosion issues. We might have more uh, sunlight infiltration that can change the dynamics of those streams. So there could be a lot of cascading effects. But the good news is that uh, we didn't have a high number that were at risk for very large losses. So prioritizing um, potential management is, is, seems feasible. Um, and I guess I'll just touch on, lastly, what we're working on now. So I don't have a lot to show for these, but if there's anything that sparks an interest here um, for anybody listening, uh, these are the types of projects we're working on right now. So again, we have the regional projects and kind of the state-specific projects. Um, regional projects, we are taking uh, tree inventories from uh, urban, urban municipal and municipal areas, towns, cities, anybody that has them and quantifying um, how much uh, valuation is in the trees that are host to invasive pests. So the host trees of emerald ash borer, host trees of Asian longhorn beetle, host trees of spotted lanternfly, and uh, oak wilt. And producing this, there'll be a nice little map where folks can click on their area or an adjacent town uh, and get this one page um, overview that can be great for city planners, conservation commissions to really prioritize treatment or prevention over complete loss of those uh, trees if the, that pest does get into the city. We are making a regenerate, tree regeneration data portal. So this is really um, comes into light of like collating and collecting data from all sorts of different uh, people and agencies that really are hard to find. Um, we've ha we have, I think, over 120 different data sets now. Um, and similarly, we are collating continuous forest inventory data um, and methods from the region. So if uh, anybody has anything that fits one of those bills, if you're interested in, I'm really soliciting any other um, information or data that you have. And it's really, uh, we, it, we provide um, benefit to anybody that that provides data in that we organize the information, um, we're uh, documenting metadata, 
um, and allowing for comparison, which I think is really interesting, of uh, different uh, data sets to others. So there will be a lot of um, interaction in those two um, data portals, and we're working on those right now. So we're hoping those will be maybe ready by the end of the year, <laughs> I'm hoping. Um, and then state projects, as I mentioned, we're doing in New York and New Hampshire forest indicators dashboards. That'll be very similar to the Vermont versions, but specifically tailored to um, data sets that those states uh, want to see in there. We're also doing some other um, kind of specific location-based um, work, so a carbon inventory for the Pisgah State Park in New Hampshire. And we're uh, quantifying the risk of uh, invasive plants being transported to the Adirondack Park from hikers and other visitors. So those were really all um, identified by our state partners, um, that those were questions and things they were very interested in, uh, but didn't have the time or resources to work on. So we can provide that information and that analysis to those groups. So the last part I'll talk about is our collaborator network. Um, so like I said, we have free access to data and tools. Everything I talked about is freely available on our website. We have free data archiving. Um, we do have a fee for service option if you're interested and I'm, you know, everything we have is free other than this, but this is really for if your organization or group or if you personally need help managing data or databases, custom web design, we can do field work. Um, we, I talk to lots of people frequently that it's hard to manage data, especially it's um, maybe been collected over a number of different people and maybe there's some information that got lost. Um, and so this is a service that we can provide. Um, and I will say that if your uh, data set seems to be high value, value, like I mentioned for data rescue, that we will help you with. That's a, if it seems like it would be useful to a range of people, we um, prioritize that data. So please get in touch if you have something that fits that bill. And so I just kind of outlined here lots of different ways. If you're interested in getting involved with us at the FEMC, we always encourage feedback um, on something. If you used a tool, if you saw something here you are interested in or um, want to see some different information, please get in touch. We have a listserv, um, and I have the URL at the end of this, so join our listserv. We send out a monthly newsletter with kind of updates, things we're working on, things are uh, people in our cooperative network are doing. Um, you could contribute data to a project, as I mentioned, soliciting regeneration, tree regeneration um, data, or any data that's for continuous forest inventory. You could archive data on the FEMC, and we have tutorials. Um, we have uh, easy to use ways to, to get that data up. So if you have any questions about that, again, please reach out. We also are willing to do trainings or presentations on tools. Um, if there's something that's very interesting to you, we can do that kind of thing. We're really trying to get more people connected um, in, in the region. Um, we are, we do host an annual conference and I have a, uh, I'll talk about that next. Um, but if there's anything else you can think of that we could be doing, you know, to help you um, or help folks you know, um, we're always interested in, in, in getting feedback and input on that. So this is uh, our conference that we're having uh, December 13th. It's very reasonable to come, only $26 to register, and that includes coffee and uh, lunch. So I think it's a pretty good deal. Um, please be, uh, you know, please check out the conference uh, website at the bottom. It has, uh, we haven't solicited, we haven't settled on the agenda yet. We're, we're doing that and we close contributed talk submissions um, and poster submissions, but if you have something you're really interested in, you can you can definitely reach out. But the theme this year, I think it's very very uh, apropos and is going to lead to a lot of good discussion. Is monitoring monitoring for impacts of climate change, tracking and measuring outcomes. So it's really about how do we look at how climate change is affecting our forests, and how do we um, figure out if we're we're doing things right as we move forward. So. That's what I got, a kind of <laughs> quick overview um, of, of the FEMC, um, some of the things we've done. This isn't a whole list, but you can go um, poke around on our website. I've listed at the top. Our listserv is the second one if you're interested in joining. 
collections and tools that I mentioned, and also our services. Um, and my email is down here if you, know, you have any questions, things come up that you're interested in. Um, but I you know, appreciate you listening to, the, listening to this, and uh, hopefully there's some interesting discussion we can have um, following this. And I, I'm willing to sh also show, um, poke around on uh, the web if you want to, if you have questions about where things are or um, want to look at a tool. I think we have some time to discuss that, so. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Ellie. Um, that was great. Um, if, you, if, if you're able to actually leave that last slide up, it might give folks a moment yeah. to uh, yeah, the type in links. There we go. Um, yeah, or, or to save the links. Um, we had a question of whether uh, uh, a PDF of the presentation will be sent out. Yes, we can archive a copy of the, of the PDF of the presentation. Um, as well as the, a link to the video recording um, after uh, after it downloads, after we're done, and then after it downloads. Um, so we're happy to share uh, this information. Um, we had a couple of questions that came in uh, during your presentation, um, and I have a yeah. feeling there's going to be a lot more. Um, so first, thanks so much for a really great talk. Um, I'm really glad that uh, you got to share this info, and people have been uh, tuning in, and I think there's a lot of good questions that will pop up. So um, Dave Pothover in Maine had a question. He asked, uh, what data set did you use to identify hemlock? Yep, so this is um, a Forest Service uh, uh, data set that exists, um, and it's the, their, their forest risk map viewer. Um, so, you know, that, that's one thing that could, that could improve um, those maps is um, since they've even been produced, um, HWA has moved up from where it was when they produced those maps. So um, there is some data updating that could that could do that could be improved. I mean, the issue is that we really don't have good species distribution maps in the region, and this is something uh, I know folks are working on. Um, like Jen Ponty is here at University of Vermont, but it's a big limitation that we would like to see um, improved is really good uh, distribution maps of species location and basal area. Um, so that could be something that, that we improve in the future. If, uh, and really it's driven by if cooperators want improved maps, we would, uh, we would definitely do that. Um, Great. Uh, we have another question um, that came in yeah. from Dave. Um, he asked, how are you coordinating with the new multi-state environmental monitoring effort led by UMAINE? Uh, the acronym is INSPIRED. Uh, UNH and UVM, uh, Tony D'Amato, um, are partners. We are um, collaborating with them, actually. Um, so that project hasn't really gotten off, hasn't started yet. Um, so we don't know what um, we'll do with that, but we are in communication with Tony D'Amato and Aaron Weisgettel uh, at uh, UMaine. So um, that is something that we will uh, probably work with um, them. We're actually, I, you know, this isn't um, comprehensive of every project we're working on, so we actually are doing uh, a continuous forest inventory um, research uh, project with Tony and Aaron um, that will kind of help with that Inspires uh, project to give some ground truthing data um, for them. So there will be some collaboration there. Awesome. Uh, Nancy, also in Maine, has a question. She yeah. asks, is the Adirondack Park project focused on aquatic invasive plants or terrestrial invasive plants? Great question. I am using not, I, I didn't use aquatic. We're using um, terrestrial and then wetland. Um, I'd be interested if you think I'm not an invasive species biologist, but I have been talking to some. Um, so if you think that that would be something we could include, but yeah, we limited it to um, terrestrial and wetland. Um, and the idea there is we're mapping user sheds. So using trail registry data um, at the Adirondack Park, we can figure out if people are honest, where they came from. So they might say their town or maybe even just their state. Um, and then we're looking at uh, invasive plant observations to see if, if certain invasive plants that don't exist in the Adirondacks, if there is a chance that they could be transported by people moving. And we can actually look since those times of trail registry data, do we actually see um, those plants in the Adirondack parks, and could that be some of the method of, of movement? Um, and this is a project we're doing with uh, Colin Beyer at SUNY ESF, um, and it was a step off from a, a previous uh, graduate student's work, but they just looked at New York distribution, so we're going to actually look at a broader um, area, including some states outside the traditional FEMC area, so Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Is there a risk of, of 
travelers bringing invasive plants. Nice. I have a feeling, Nancy, who is an invasive plant biologist, may be following up with you. <laughs> yes, yeah, great. Um, so, we have awesome. Time. Yay. Okay, um, Bob Warner Rail down in Massachusetts has yes. a question. What about deer browse monitoring, for example? Uh, Tom Rowinski's 10 tallest data, um, SII Plus, uh, sorry, as assessed by McWilliams et al. in 2018, and he has a long uh, paper name. Um, so deer browse data monitoring, I guess that's another uh, another question. Yeah, that's great. No, I, I kind of, I kind of brushed through that in the regeneration project. Yeah, it is part of it that it's not just for tree regeneration. I'm also doing an aspect of seed, uh, like mast data, so any seed data from, from trees, and also um, browse. So there will kind of be those three different tracks. Um, and so we have been talking to Tom and other folks that have browse data, so that will be part of it. Um, and then I will say, too, that um, our forest uh, health monitoring program I mentioned at the beginning, we have 49 plots in Vermont, 20 plots in Massachusetts. We're expanding, hopefully, to the other states um, next year. That We do um, record browse damage, um, and I think we're going to maybe increase the, the data we collect on browse, um, like species that are getting browsed, just because it's such a um, important aspect of our future forest, and a lot of people are worried about um, ungulate browse. So that's something that we will that we have on an annual basis and a plot by plot basis. Um, and the nice thing about that, it allows us for presence and absence of browse, and so we could look at how that varies across forest types. Awesome, thanks. I actually have a follow up question about the forest yeah. health monitoring plots. Um, could you just describe a little bit about what's what's measured in those plots, or kind of the general distribution, or how the plots are established? Yeah, so it um, it is very much similar to FIA forest inventory and analysis. In fact, the federal government forest service does have a forest health monitoring program, and that's the FIA is part of that. Um, so it really was was established long ago. Um, and uh, the state of Vermont collected data on these forest health monitoring plots only at uh, Mount Mansfield, which is our tallest mountain in Vermont, um, and as a protected land, and then Lybrook Wilderness in the southern part of Vermont. So they did that for many years, um, and then in 2014, the FEMC took it over and added more plots to kind of <laughs> round out the, you know, the distribution of forests that are um, represented. And so unlike FIA, that's a five or now seven year rotation on when plots are measured, we, we go out every year. So this allows for, we, we can only measure, we can't measure as many plots, but it allows for annual measurement. So it's a nice combination with things like FIA or other data sets. And so we do tree metrics like um, diameter and height. Um, and seedling regeneration, saplings, we um, do consider regeneration anything that has at least one true leaf. So we're really getting that uh, germination and survivalship of seedlings over time. We collect some plot metrics, like I said, like browse, invasive species, um, disturbance uh, and forest canopy cover. So we do hemispherical photos that we can measure how the forest canopy is changing over time. And then we also do forest health metrics. So these are ocular assessments, eye assessments of, of crown health. Um, so things like vigor and dieback, defoliation, um, and uh, transparency. Defoliation was really important when we went down to Massachusetts this past year um, with gypsy moth. Um, and so that gives us an annual um, estimate of how healthy these trees are, um, how well they can re respond to stress. And we make all these data public. I will say that too. It's all in our data archive if you'd like to see. Um, we have a great uh, manual, uh, field manual, that outlines how we collect the data. If anybody else um, is interested to check that out, or if you have input as we expand to New York, New Hampshire, Maine, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, um, hopefully next year, or at least um, begin the process next year. If you have any input, love to hear it. That's super exciting. Thanks. Um, related to all that cool data, uh, Bob has another question. How did you filter data by state as seen in some of your slides? What about butternut canker, beech bark disease? Robert, is that in terms of the, I'm thinking that's for the Forest Health Atlas where I showed um, the, uh, the aerial detection damage? Is that what that's in reference to? 
He says maybe. Do you have maybe. a question mark? <laughs> maybe. I could go back to that slide. Um, did I filter data? Let me go back and see if this sparks sparks a remembrance. Uh, this is this. Yes, there were tabs, one was filtered by state. Oh, hmm. Yeah, so you filter by state um, over, I guess you can't see it underneath my, um, oops. You know, I have this right here um, under, you can actually, it, will, it shows all states. I have, have this other image on top of it, but right here it lists the states and you basically unclick them. Um, so that's pretty easy. You can click multiple states or, um, or one state. For this uh, example here, I just clicked Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut because I knew that that was um, kind of this hot spot for gypsy moth. Um, unless maybe you were announcing your comment, maybe you were thinking of this is uh, for, we also have the option. So we have pretty much every tool we built, we, have, we like options that um, people can filter data and information. So on our DEN, the Dendro Ecological Database, you can also look, okay, that is it, great. You can also look, so we just have these states represented now, and that's basically where we have data from. A lot of my data is here in my previous research group, um, but that we're not geographically limited to this area. Um, so basically, this is just grouping by state, and it's a way to browse. Um, I didn't screen capture it here, but we also have a search option um, here, and I, I didn't take an image of that, but if you want to go explore that in that, you could actually type in the state or, or states you wanted. Um, these, these ways here to look at the data are really just to browse. Um, if you're curious, you could click on Massachusetts, you can click on New Hampshire, it would jump to that. Cool, thank you. Um, let's see, sort of following up on that, um, I, I'm wondering who creates all the visual graphics, uh, you know, like what you see here or like the forest indicators dashboards. Uh, it looks very, to me, it looks very colorful and appealing and uh, easy to find out what I'm trying to find out about the data. So like who actually turns all that science and all that data into these tools? <laughs> Yeah, well, we have um, a web developer, and we had Mike Finnegan for many years. And fortunately, he he moved on to another job, and um, we are have just hired um, a couple new web developers that are uh, kind of splitting the position. So we're working on that, but we have great folks that that we work with that um, the, that understand ecology and forestry, but also can do the web development. Is this kind of sweet spot we look for? Um, to understand how things would work and what makes sense. So um, it's, and we have, I should say, we also have Emma Tate on staff that um, she does a lot of this uh, coding for how the interface will actually work. Because not only is it how it looks, but how if you click this, what happens? Or if you people want to filter by different um, aspects, what does that mean in the data set? So we have to think about that a lot by how is the data organized? What would someone want to do? How does it look? Does it make sense that it looks that way? So we do a lot of different iterations. Um, we test them out with folks. We ask um, people to play around with it and look at it, especially our target audience. Like, does this, can you interpret this? Can you find the help? Can you figure out how to uh, download data? So we do a lot of different uh, kind of workshops like that with people or um, informal, uh, you know, asking folks to, to poke around on the, on the tool. So again, if you find stuff, oh, I thought this would do this or this didn't work, we constantly are happy to have that feedback. We are a pretty small group of people and we're, we do a lot. Um, so we sometimes have things on our website that, oh, this link is broken or this doesn't look right and we really appreciate any, any feedback folks have on those kind of things. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so we are just one minute before the top of the hour. Um, I, wow. don't, I know, time flies when you're having fun. Um, oh yeah, I got my Forest Steward Guild sticker. You can see that. Yay, <laughs> nice job. Um, so um, it's probably about time to wind down, but I have to give one more plug for the FENC conference. Mm -hmm. um, it is Friday, December 13th. Um, at University of Vermont's uh, Conference Center. Um, last year was awesome. It was the first time I'd been to the conference, and it was one I'm like, why haven't I come to this before? Um, so again, <laughs> as you said, the, the working, there's still, um, you can still submit a working session uh, proposal, um, mm -hmm. and there's gonna be lots of great presentations. It's a great opportunity to network. 26 bucks is a steal for all the information and, uh, and networking you'll get to do. 
um, it's, re it's a really great opportunity to connect with other people, not just from Vermont, but from all the surrounding states um, that are involved in monitoring our forests and looking at ways to use monitoring to help you know, increase our ability to address climate change challenges. So plug there. Um, we're now great. at yeah, 1 o'clock. <laughs> Yay. All right, so yeah, we're now at 1 o'clock. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, again, this webinar has been recorded and will be archived on the Forest Stewards Guild website. Thanks a huge bunch to Allie for taking the time to share all this uh, information and resource with us. Um, and again, uh, we'll, uh, yeah, Allie, do you want to put back to your contact info just for a last yeah. slide? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Feel free so, to contact please. me. Thanks for listening and, and uh, participating in great questions. And yeah, hopefully, uh, you all get involved with the FDNC in some way, um, check out our website. Sounds great. Thank you, Allie, and thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Amanda.